You're listening to The Dating Den with dating and relationship badass and best-selling author, Marnie Batista. Every week, you'll get the raw truth from top experts and real people on the important dating, sex, and relationship issues you want to know about. So if you're ready for true talk that's authentic and unfiltered, and you're not afraid to be called out on your <clears throat> stuff, then you're ready for what's next. The Dating Den with Rachel Kosser. How your body language is revealing your deepest fears about love. Ladies, welcome into the dating den. I'm so excited. So I uh, became a social media stalker recently on Clubhouse. And I've never done that before, but I was playing around on there. And I met the most amazing person who's going to be on the show right now. Her name is Rachel Kossar. She is the founder of Choreography for Business. You're going to love it. She's a body language and presence expert. I mean, don't we want to know what men are thinking by their body language? But guess what? That means that they know stuff about us too. Uh, She has this really cool background in nonverbal performance in extremely high pressure context. So for 15 years, Rachel trained and competed as a rhythmic gymnast on the Canadian national team. How cool is that? Then she joined the Boston Ballet. She performed lead roles in front of thousands of audience members and on stages across the globe. And she's also got experience as a major gift fundraising professional at Harvard University and the New England Conservatory. She applies her program, her programmatic content into real world business scenarios. So I called her up and I was like, I know you do stuff for business, but could this apply in interpersonal relationships and dating? And she was like, hell yes. So that is what we are going to be talking about today. Okay. So my first question is this, because I always wanted to like interview someone like from the FBI or something and be like, you know, do you use your secret powers like in your own personal life? And so when I saw you, that was the first thing I wanted to know is like, do you use your powers in your real life? And in, if so, how? (laughs) That is a great question. And so first of all, thank you for having me, Arnie. This is very exciting. I've always wanted to do more work in the dating world. So um, thank you. And in in answer to your question, yes, I do. I do use my quote unquote superpowers in my personal life and in, in the real world. And one of my favorite things to do ever is just to take people watching up to the next level um, whenever we're at cafes or restaurants or even just walking around and you see a couple sitting together on a bench or having a conversation, there are all kinds of cues you can pick up on. And one of my favorite games is, you know, what number date are, are they on? So, oh my gosh. Okay. So, uh, so how, let's just talk about that, right? Right off the bat. So how do you know if someone is like on the first date versus like the third or fourth date? What are the cues that you see? Yes. So in general, when we're talking about nonverbal communication and body language in particular, where people tend to get tripped up a little bit is they have a hyper focus on what's going on with the face. Okay. About facial expressions and eye contact. And like, yes, that is a whole category that is very, very important. But when you have the luxury of seeing someone's full body, there are all these other cues that are going on that can actually provide a lot of overarching context and information, right? So for example, if I see two people at a dinner, let's say we're in a restaurant, my husband and I will most likely be sitting at the bar because we, we don't like the setup of the table. We find that it puts too much distance and too much kind of official uh, business Oh yeah, totally. You're not like shoulder to shoulder. Exactly. Yeah. And we can go back to that because I actually think that's a very uh, compelling point to, to play around with if if you are in the, in the dating scene and and you're trying to figure out where you should sit and you know, what kind of vibe you want to help put out there. Okay. I see, let's say I see a couple sitting at a table face to face. Okay. it, It is pretty confrontational just from a social dynamic perspective. Are the couples, are, are they both leaning in? Is one person leaning in more than the other? Oftentimes, right, there's two people being on a first date 
you're not going to have that same level of relaxed and you know, in your skinness. There'll be a little bit more of an over exaggeration of certain expressive elements. You know, the woman might be leaning in a little bit more if she's trying to really show that she's interested. I find that men, when they're trying to show that they're very interested, they'll have a little bit more of an intense eye gaze and ah. hold on eye contact, right? So okay. with women, we tend to see a, a lot more of that upper body forward lean in motion. And then with men, we tend to see a lock on eye gaze. Um, and, and right, so not that a couple that's been around together for a while wouldn't exhibit those things, but what you would see is probably a little bit more of a relaxed sensibility between them versus that more charged like I'm trying to convey my interest or I'm trying to show that I'm interesting as well um, are some of the things you can look out for so let me ask you this because when, back when I was dating I was always like leaning in I still do it and I also squinch my brow <laughs> because mm -hmm. I'm really trying to like and at one point I was thinking is that too, like, is that like a masculine energy, right? Like leaning in, squinching your brow, like really trying, like, you know, really focusing. Is that, is there such a thing as that? Or is that just sort of connote like intensive or like wanting to just really hear? Yeah. So the, when we come, when we start to talk about the differences in body language, held by men in general and women in general, you know, making some pretty egregious standardizations across what can very often be a very complicated, um, very complicated element of, of communication. Um, what, what I prefer to, to suggest is that, you know, by and large, we have these seven universal expressions right? okay. that, that most in the same way. And those are happiness, anger, shock, disgust, contempt. Um, and I think, I think the other one's surprise. Um, but anyway, so these big kind of universal emotions that you see someone smiling and you're like, Oh, they're happy. You see right. someone frowning and you're like, that person is angry. You, you right. And, and those are easy to distinguish often across cultures, even, um, I think the most important thing when we're talking about the more idiosyncratic cues of nonverbal communication, so what you, Marnie, do when you're focused in thinking and trying to show interest could be very different from what I, Rachel, do to express focus, interest, and, and you know, a general sense of I'm happy to be here and listen to you, right? Um, the, the, the scrunching of your eyebrows that you mentioned, that, that's actually a very interesting component of facial expression and that that area is actually called the glabella right and we do tend to scrunch it forward when we are either focused or intent okay. on something but it can also correlate to some of those more universal expressions of you know consternation anger or frustration right and so the number one thing that i always start with is let's first be aware of some of the nonverbal cues that we tend to put out into the world, that's, lem that's let's then reflect on whether those are clear and are aligned with our intention, right? Whether they're congruent. So that's another big thing we talk about in nonverbal communication, right? If you, if my intention is to show interest and active listening and really uh, taking in what someone's saying and absorbing it. I want to make sure that I might, I'm not also confusing someone by potentially letting them feel like, right. If, if I, if I do that eyebrow scrunch movement, right. Even I know people, listeners can't see this right now, but there's a difference between right. Having a, an engaged and open face, maybe a slight head tilt and a head nod versus a more intense, Round. Right. Which, which if you were watching this, that's what I'm doing. I'm like so into Rachel. I'm like, like leaning forward. I'm like my, eye, I'm like, let me take every single word and like have it filtrate into my body. Um, so that's super interesting. So let me ask you this. And I, I wrote down that we're going to talk about shoulder to shoulder ladies. So don't panic. Um, I always say that 
our unconscious beliefs, our paradigms, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about men, you know, whether we're guarded, whether we're open is I call it leaking, right? Like, so you might show up on a date, you're wearing like the most amazing outfit, you got your, you know, your hair is on point, your makeup is on point. Um, and you can sort of leak like insecurities or fears or guardedness. And I'm just curious, first of all, what's your opinion on that? And then if so, like what can our ladies do to really have that authentic, optimal body language that is congruent? Yes. So kind of going back to the, the, what I said earlier of, you know, really taking in the whole body when we're talking about nonverbal communication when it comes to nonverbal leakage is the technical term for it, having. Really? That's a real technical term? Absolutely. Yep. Oh my God. I thought I made it up. See people, leakage is a thing. <laughs> nonverbal leakage. Let's go. <laughs> yes. Yes. And actually you said that you, you know, you wish you could have, um, have a conversation with like an FBI, ex FBI, right. FBI agent. Right. The other gentleman on the call or on the clubhouse that we were on, Joe Navarro. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he and I are good friends and, you know, so we talk about this stuff all the time, but I, I'm not sure if he coined the term nonverbal leakage or, or what, but I learned it from him. So. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. I love him. I want him on the show too. So maybe you can hook me up. Okay. Carry on. He's, he's amazing. Um, so w- when we're talking about, so let's say I'm on a date and I'm nervous, right? And I, I think I could like this guy, but you know, I, I, I'm nervous because I am a little bit socially awkward or like the last time I went on a date, I kind of, you know, I, I didn't feel like I really showed my best self. And so I'm a little bit nervous, right? As you said, I can have the best outfit. I can have my hair done. You know, I can also be saying some very interesting things, but the nonverbal leakage might actually be happening in my hands, right? So many of us have a fidget that we do that actually helps us move through that nervous energy, right? So if we think about anxiety and nervous energy, those things are very difficult to just, right? So it has to move somewhere. That energy has to move somewhere. And oftentimes that energy will move to our fingers, right? So maybe it's picking your nails or it could be playing with your hair or it might be fiddling with jewelry. It might be rubbing your hands on your legs, right? Or even rubbing your hands on your arms, right? Self-touch, is a very, it's what we call a pacifying behavior. So self-touch is something we do to soothe ourselves. So if I'm feeling nervous, right, the first thing I'm going to do is give myself some kind of reassurance. Mm. Right. Okay. Yep. So me knowing myself, I will fidget with my hands. Right. And because I know that of myself, I can preemptively, if I feel like, okay, a little bit nervous, I can go through a series of techniques and tools that I have. And and this is kind of part of the the programming that I share with my clients, but I I have a series of techniques that I can go through to help me feel more grounded, more present, more confident, and therefore engage in a way that is not obstructed by distracting nonverbal behaviors that someone may subconsciously pick up on and say, oh, you know, she seemed kind of like fidgety all night. Yeah. Like just not comfortable with herself. Yeah. Something's off. I used to do, um, many years ago, we would do uh, speed dating events. So I'd have my clients sit at the tables and I'd have the guys come in. And of course there was like a pen, a pen on the table. Um, and I was just fascinated because all my like executive clients, you know, the, the pen was to like make notes after like on, you know, rating and they would literally, they'd pick up the pen, they would fidget the pen. They had like elbows on the table, like very much like, look, I even furrow my brow when I'm, you know, like they were like, okay, I'm interviewing you. I'm in my, like, this is my work self. Um, and it was just fascinating watching that fidget with like the pen, like with a pen or whatever it is that was on the table. I also yeah. used to have a client who had like, she was a large breasted woman and she would wear, um, like a jet, like her outer, she always had outerwear. That was just like her thing. And, uh, she went out on one of these wing girl sessions that we used to do. And the coach was like, she was constantly pulling the jacket 
Mm-hmm. Right? Like just fidgeting even with her outerwear. So if if there's nothing like a, a pen, like it sounds like you're just constant. If you don't have that handled, you're going to fidget some way. Yes. And it could be with the edge of a tablecloth. It could be with the cutlery itself. It could be moving. Like I've seen a lot of people constantly moving their cup or their glass around. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and it's not that you have to be a stone statue and not moving at all. Right. But what you, what you want to do is, is have a free reign of your hands at all times so that you can gesture in a way that's effective. Um, so that you can maintain a presence and a command that maybe aligns with, you know, whatever, um, whatever level of intensity, but then whatever energy you kind of, you want to be quote unquote bringing to the table. Um, right. And so going back to what I was saying earlier, of like, is this couple on a first date? Are they enjoying the date? Things like that. You can kind of pick up on some more of these fidgety kind of leakage things and it's, it's incongruent, right? So their faces may be like overly animated, but maybe their foot below the table is, you know, jiggling all over the place. Right. And you're like, okay, there's right again. And it's not necessarily like, Oh, if anyone's sitting at a table and they're jiggling their foot, it means that they're on a first date, but it's like, (laughs) there's something interesting going on here that doesn't quite meet the eye. Right. It could be that this person is like actually has her mind half on some issue or problem at work while she's also having dinner with a friend or her partner or her significant other, you know? And and so the the beauty of nonverbal communication is not in making judgments about people and it's not in lie detection or any of that, like that, that's never, or that never should be the goal of nonverbal communication. Uh, Reading what, what is helpful is, okay, I've noticed these details like what might those mean and how might I change my questioning or introduce other layers of questioning that might help us get to a deeper sense of the truth? I love this. So when you talk about fidgeting, there's one thing that I have to know because I'm guessing that the phone has become like a basic <laughs> like accessory for nonverbal communication that I think gets in the way of people making a connection. I know that like when I'm watching a movie that's scary, like I want to touch my phone. (laughs) You know, I know that if I'm like irritated with my husband, I want to like, I grab my phone. It's like becoming like a new fidget thing. Do you think that people are using their phones in a way that is causing a disconnection? Yes. No, to me, there's no question to me. A phone is a barrier to the present moment that you might be sharing with someone. Um, I notice a few things about phone usage. I notice that as soon as someone picks it up, the intensity of that relationship between the person and the phone automatically becomes primary to yep. the that you should technically be sharing with whoever's in that bubble of presence with you in that moment. That's one thing I noticed. The other thing I notice: as soon as one person picks up their phone, it's just a matter of seconds before the other person reaches for their phone. Totally. Cause you're like, Oh, you're not with me. I might as well go be with somebody else. Yes. Well, and there's also, you know, mirroring ah. it's a big part of nonverbal communication. And while normally mirroring behavior is a very good sign, right? So that's another thing I look for when I'm looking at couples in a restaurant or people watching, right? How many people's nonverbal behaviors are in synchrony versus the opposite. Right. Um, but we also tend to have a habit of mirroring, you know, someone we trust or, or someone we like. And, and so if someone picks up their phone and, you know, we are in some kind of relation with them, like that our tendency is almost doubled to pick up our phone. Number one, because we've seen someone who we're supposed to be in a close conversation with do that same behavior. And then number two, we do have a level, a certain level of addiction to uh, addiction and, and comfort around having our phone there as something that we know it's all you know unfortunately it's in in other times we may have used like a good book as like oh it doesn't matter if I have to wait like five hours in line I have a really good book to keep me company now we have this like constantly 
uh, nagging phone. <laughs> oh my God. It's like when you were saying like a book, I was thinking, or like a pacifier, <laughs> right? Like it goes, it goes way, way back. So yep. let me ask you about this. So you gave some really good examples of like awkwardness or maybe insecurity. What does it look like when somebody is showing up on a date and they might be like intimidating or guarded or armored or um, I think intimidating. A lot of our listeners will say, you know, mm -hmm. am I intimidating on a date? People tell me I'm intimidating, whether it's a limiting belief or it's the truth. How might that show up? Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to talk about eye contact. Okay. Vis-a-vis -vis that question. And here's why. I think especially in the US and in, in some other Western countries and cultures, eye contact is used as a, as a dominance, as a cue of dominance, as a cue of strength, as a cue of confidence, right? The, the issue is that most people leave the instruction or the education at make sure you make eye contact. Right. As opposed to when you're entering into a business conversation or it, you're being introduced to someone for the first time, you want to anchor your eye contact on not only their person, but their eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to make this connection right up front. I want you to feel that I've seen you. And I personally also want to make that connection for myself, right? It's the way that we register someone's facial expressions and their whole person, right? So we want to take them in. But once you've kind of anchored that, person's eyes with your own, you have to then adopt a more personal cadence of eye contact. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes when we're recalling a fact, we might look up into the left, or if we're recalling a story that we've experienced, right, we might think about it and remember it by looking up into the right. And those things are very normal frequencies of, of eye contact, right? What, what we don't do is stare straight ahead unblinkingly and unwaveringly, right? And, and as a matter of fact, there are only three occasions where you would ever actually do that or see that, quote unquote, out in the wild, right? And you would only ever not break eye contact with someone if you were, A, in a moment of very close uh, amory and intimacy. Right. Right. Because you're with your partner, you're very, you're very close from a uh, social, from a social distance perspective. And, and there, there's no mistaking, you know, your interest and your passion for that person. Right. So we don't break eye contact. Nothing else is coming in to, right. It's just you and that person in the moment. That's one. Right. And so you can see how that would come off as very intense if you, if you just weren't at that level yet with that person. Yeah, for sure. Right? Uh, number two, or the second reason would be if, there, if you sense a threat in the other person, right? So you're feeling intimidated and you're going to not take your eyes off this person because you don't trust them, right? Interesting. That's okay. The third and final reason is if you are the aggressor and you are going to attack someone and you're definitely not going to run at someone or attack someone if you're not looking at them 100% of the time, right? You're, you're probably not even going to blink. Interesting. So on a date, yeah, so how does that show up on a date? Are you just like trying to, looking at them, like scanning, like are they trustworthy? I mean, how does that, how do we do that? So how it shows up with people who tend to come off as slightly more intimidating, right, is, yeah. is oftentimes overcorrection of something that they've been told or something that they've been trying to practice, right? So for many, right, many people growing up, it's always like it's polite to look at someone in their eyes. Okay. And it's in, in the business world, like especially for women, you want to assert your dominance and your confidence. So you will look at that person in the eyes and you might actually stare at them until they look away, right? Like th these are things that we're kind of being taught. In yeah, totally. Culture. And then all of a sudden you get on a date and you're like, well, um, I definitely, I, I want to be polite. I, I want to show this person I'm interested. I also, you know, I want to stand my ground and show that I'm a confident woman. So I'm going to, you know, not break eye contact with this person. And next thing you know, you're in a staring contest. Yeah. That's not sexy. <laughs> it's, it's not sexy. It's terrifying. It's intimidating for the other person. Um, I have, I have, I know a few people who are culprits of this, you know, and not that I, I don't think it's ever really a great idea to provide unsolicited feedback. Um, 
I, but every now and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mention You'll it. point it out. Well, that's they feel like, they're like, Oh, I don't know why. I'm like, so for example, I'm not going to mention any names, but don't I, do the names thing. Let's, but let's get real. Right. So I have, I have a two, two friends that I'll just give an example of. Cause okay. I one is a woman and one is a man. Okay. And so my one girlfriend is, is she's very expressive and she's lovely and she's wonderful, but, but she will lock eyes with someone very, very, like almost immediately upon meeting them. And she's petite and she's lovely and uh, there's no, no trouble being very feminine. Right. And so what it does for whoever she's speaking with, and when I say whoever she's speaking with, I mean both men and women. Alike, okay. Yep. Is it very quickly makes you feel like maybe this is love at first sight. Oh, okay. So it's like intense. It's intense. You feel like you're the only person in the entire world when this person is looking at you like that, right? Which is great. But what happens with her is that then she's confused because she's like, oh, she constantly has to turn people down. Oh. Right? Yep. Oh, she all, all of a sudden has someone saying, uh, you know, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Like, I'm not looking for anything really serious here. And, you know, this person's like, yeah, neither was I, you know, but it's like, okay, but you weren't, your body wasn't expressing that, right? Interesting. You your eye contact was expressing something very different. Okay. So that's one example. Okay. The other example is a male friend of mine who is an engineer. So, you know, I think he's, he also describes himself as an introvert. Um, and so when it comes to social situations, right, this is where I think we see that overcorrection of I've been told to look at someone in the eye. I've been told that it is respectful. I've been told that that is the way you treat another human. Like, I know these things. Right. So I'm like overcompensating. And so you'll be in a conversation with him and you're like, are we about to fight? Like, <laughs> are we about to fight? Because like, what's happening, right? And it's, it's, again, a lot of it is just the intensity of the eye contact. And it's like, you know, what would be great is if you just, you know, increased your blink rate a little bit, you know, like maybe you looked down as you were considering something and then looked back up at the person, right? Like uh, give yourself the opportunity to not, you, know, you shouldn't be roaming around with your eyes, but at, at, again, unless we're dealing with one of those three situations, you shouldn't be uh, staring un unblinkingly at anyone. Oh my God, that's, I'm scared just thinking about it. So how does this all connect in with that congruence and that authenticity? Because I can imagine like all my wonderful ladies who tend to be a little bit in their head are now like, oh my God, do I blink too much? Do I look too much? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? How am I supposed to be? And then they're going to be even more in their head. So like, what's the, like, what's the process that you kind of take someone through so that they have this just identity and this like that confidence that you're talking about that where you're just feeling like you can be coming from your whole self, not just like trying to like move your body yes. in a way to get a certain message across. For sure. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think the other myth that can sometimes come into this whole discussion around nonverbal communication, right? The first one we discussed being that you can just detect lies and make judgments about what people are thinking, which like, let's just be clear. That's not how this works. The, the second myth is that, you can just adopt certain expressions or postures or movements, and then you're automatically sending a specific message, right? If it's not authentic, if it doesn't feel good to you, the other person will pick up on that discomfort very quickly, right? And again, it won't be an explicit, like, oh, well, that person like said something positive, but shook their head. And it's not, people aren't picking up on things to that level, but subconsciously they'll notice something is off, right? Right. Right. So wait, let me just ask you this question. Cause you know, I have um, on our show, we uh, do these like recaps of the bachelor and the bachelorette uh -huh. <laughs> and last season, the, the main character, this guy, like whenever he felt like got asked a question that where he wanted, he was had an opportunity to be vulnerable or authentic. What he would do is he'd put his hand on the woman's thigh and kind of lean in and like avoid the question, but like create this physical sense of intimacy rather than like an emotional intimacy. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, my, my colleague and I who do the shows, Chris, we were just like, wow, it's like such a, like a player move, you know, like come in, but like avoid. And I'm wondering if that's one of those things that people 
do that's like a, a unconscious way of of leaning in but like not being expressive or avoiding so i i i admit i don't watch the bachelor so. that's okay maybe i'll make you watch it and then have you come on and you can like deep dive on it yeah so <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm gonna shoot from the hip here okay go let's do it i love it however what i would say is just based on the little i know of the bachelor i wouldn't be surprised if this person was doing that on purpose um, but because as soon as you touch someone in an area, like on an area of your body, right, it could be the small of your back is a very sensitive area for women. It could be like an upper arm, upper like leg thigh area. Absolutely. Like that is like, that is a very like intimate place to, to touch. And as yeah. soon as you kind of come into contact like that, your the person who's receiving that touch physiologically and also mentally, you, you kind of go off. Hay- haywire right and it short circuits everything and you become hyper focused on the this like charged energy of physical intimacy and physical touch right and because it's not your own and because it's probably coming from someone who you are attracted to it kind of is like if anyone's seen that movie um what is that pixar animation film with like the different people in your brain oh um inside out inside out right? yes like, like, woo, woo, woo. yeah <laughs> physical touch like whatever <laughs> and and so it can be very very easy to use that as a moment and as a tactic to distract uh, so, ladies put a pin in that one write that down in your in your uh, how to spot a player handbook okay go ahead but, but i mean only you know only if like you're trying to get intimate on an emotional and an intellectual level and then this person's like i'm not comfortable with that let me bring this to a level that i am comfortable at which would be physical Right. Yeah, so, that's it. Well, that's really interesting. And I think because we all and I know we're totally on the sidetrack now, but I think this is a really important piece because I think a lot of women that that struggle with this is that their brain says one thing, uh, but someone else's body language is saying I'm into you. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we can then be distracted from what's missing in the relationship or what we're not getting because of that that signal. Right. And that's like pretty much sounds like a great of mixed signals, right? Like I'm doing yes. this, but I'm avoiding intimacy or I'm avoiding talking about things that are about the future or whatever it is. So that's really interesting. That is like very much what a mixed signal would be. Right. Right. Um, and very, you know, very tactfully done sounds like, um, <laughs> I know, I know you, you got to go on the, you got to go on YouTube now and you can watch like Matt James in the, <laughs> That is so funny. Um, did you, had you, was there a question right before that, that you asked? There me? was. Um, people are like, Marnie, why did you just take her on a damn tangent? Um, we were talking about what is it that will send that message of authenticity, right? Like, what is it that, you know, how do we, how do we not be in our head with all of these things yeah. and be authentic in our, in our verbal, nonverbal expression? Yes. So going back to what I said earlier, the first piece in all of this is to be aware of how you tend to show up. Myself, I know that if I'm getting very nervous or preoccupied or impatient, I start to like fidget with my hands and my nails, right? So I'm aware of that, which means that I can catch myself doing that more readily. And even I can preemptively stop myself from doing that and instead go through that the, the presence and mindfulness exercise that I mentioned to you before that can be done in preparation. So, for example, if I'm going on, you know, on a date or I'm meeting someone and I'm like, this, this meeting has to go well, I'll take a moment to myself to really reconnect with my intention, with my goal for the meeting or the date, with right, with everything that is true to me mm. and align myself around that so that I can, at, at the very least, get rid of any anxious, nervous energy and turn it into something positive. Right. Um, and that, that kind of a preparatory exercise I call physical anchoring. Right. And it's all about being in the present moments, allowing yourself to, to breathe and have good circulation and good oxygenation. And then walk into a space really feeling like your full self. Right. As opposed to kind of running into something rushed and then kind of being overwhelmed and and sitting down and immediately feeling like you're out of place or you should have done this or you should have done that. 
um, or generally being preoccupied. Um, I love so- that. So that, so I just want to like underline that too. So that means ladies, like when you're going to go on a date or you're going to go into a presentation or whatever it is, that whole like frenetic rushing, not taking a pause, not grounding or anchoring to, uh, who you are, what your goal is like that. So- I mean, I would assume that it's a, like a softening into yourself versus like, ah, you know, like I got to get the, this better be the one. Blah, blah, blah. He better not waste my time. Right. All of that stuff, which will totally sidetrack our, our, our outcome. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I like that visual of softening into yourself, but then also, Right, it's kind of like when something does soften or or relax, like when a muscle relaxes, it expands, mm, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's, if it's constricted, right, then it's tense, it's small, right, and it's compact. And what we want to do ideally, right, if we're feeling comfortable, if we're if we are feeling like we are able to relax in a setting, which hopefully if you're on a date, you can, we we can soften and we can expand. And I think Mm. the expansion piece is really crucial for women as well, because we do tend to make ourselves a little bit smaller and take up less space. And, you know, it's not about extending beyond your frame and taking up, like, it's not about like putting your arms around all the tables and chairs and trying to like, you know, take up more space. It's territorial splays are are often, again, a sign of overcompensating. Um, And men, men are huge culprits for that. And I'm just like, can we stop? taking up five chairs. Um, but right. As a woman, just really easing into your whole physicality and allowing yourself to use your gestures fully, allowing yourself to have that open posture, right. Mm. That emanates again, that warm opening, but it also emanates this very beautiful self-confidence, right. That is authentic to each one of us because we all have different frames. We all hold ourselves slightly differently, but if, if we're able to really be open and receptive, Right. That immediately starts to get us to a point where we can be vulnerable with someone else. Um, right. I, I love that. I'm like now I'm mesmerized. I'm like watching you be open and expansive. Uh, no, but the energy of it is so different. Right. Like and that's why I, I really want to drive this point home, because if you're on a date and you are being you are being in your own unique openness, right? Which is very different than Googling. How do I look open on a date? You know, like, yeah. which is like, Oh, keep my shoulders back. You know, like then you're back in your head. And so I, I really love this idea of really connecting to, again, that like you use words like congruence, alignment, mm-hmm. like authenticity, right? Like that is very much a part of, uh, self-confidence and self-worth and, and being okay, taking up space without, like you said, having to, to overcompensate, which is super, super interesting. Okay. Clearly we're going to have to have you back because we're going on and on, but I have two quick questions. I want to talk about shoulder to shoulder, but I really want to get this pandemic question, uh, taken care of because I've noticed this in myself. I went to New York recently and there's like no masks on the street required now. And Things are opening up and I was aware of my, um, unconscious, like, eh, like feeling like I need to pull back from people. Like I'm scared of people. I'm walked through the airport, you know? And I was like, Whoa, like, you know, like people have like they're leaking poison. What do we do as, as daters and people that are trying to make connection, getting back into feeling comfortable being with humans, especially dating. Yeah. So that, I mean, I think we, I, I think we'll all experience a little bit of that trauma yeah. around being close to people we don't know. I think that, you know, luckily there's been a lot more opening up as people get vaccinated and as, as the restrictions ease and as the count numbers go, go down in all the bad areas. Um, I think that, Number one, it's always you have to do what you're comfortable with. So while I might say, you know, consider having like a pre, uh, pre, uh, like a pre conversation around like, oh, like, are you vaccinated? What is your comfort level? You know, and and here I'm talking about a planned date. Yeah. So meet cute on the street. Um, But, you know, if it's a planned date, like just have that conversation up front so that you can feel 
the most uninhibited when you finally do meet that person face to face. That's always helpful. Um, you know, if you're having an initial conversation over the phone first or over video, then, you know, you have the opportunity to at least become slightly more comfortable in a conversation style before you do meet them in person. Um, what if you see the hot guy at Starbucks? What if you're back to Starbucks and you see the hot guy and you're like, I want to talk to this guy and I don't want to have nonverbal leakage of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just well, pulled back for those of you that obviously can't see me. I demonstrated my fear yeah. and <laughs> horror of being, uh, having someone breathe on me. So, I mean, I, I, to, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I think it's really hard to get around if both people are wearing masks and you also don't know what mm-hmm. the other person's comfort level is. Right. Like right now it's just hard. Yeah. However, however, there are many ways that you can creatively get around that to grab someone's attention, right? Like maybe it's, you know, in, well, maybe not inter. I'm like, how did you like intercept and write a little note somewhere on the cup that's like, hey, like, you know, I thought, you know, you're very eye catching, or I got the same drink order as you, and you know, I'm gonna wait outside, but we'd love to say hi, or like, you know, something like that, where you could kind of slip in like a little, let's not try to do this awkward dance inside, but like outside, or if the person is sitting at a table and they do take their mask off, right? I opportunities there. I I love it. I think. What I hear you saying is that it's going to, we have to just get, make friends with the fact that it is going to be uncomfortable until we transition back into whatever it is going to look like. Yeah. And maybe even if we just normalize the discomfort and the awkwardness, then it gives us permission to say silly things like, um, you know, I'm going to be sitting outside, you know, I'd love to <laughs> I'd love to chat more like out in the air or whatever it is. Like maybe just normalizing our awkwardness. Yes. And, you know, bring, making the implicit explicit, naming it and claiming it, acknowledging it, like acknowledging the discomfort, just being like, yeah, I know this sucks. Um, but like, I still think it's worth it to whatever, do this. And, and just, just knowing yourself and then respecting the other person's, potential comfort level, I would say like throwing caution to the winds and just going up to the person and getting in their personal space anyways, is absolutely not the thing to do right now. Um, but thinking creatively and having a good time, like coming up with different ways you might again, pop up on someone's radar, uh, in a way that again, like is, is very respectful and very much like denotes and, and, um, you know, puts your interest on the table. It, that can be very sexy and very fun you know, coming, coming from speaking from a woman's perspective. Right. And, you know, I think there's, uh, I don't think very many people are doing that right now. And so anyone who does do that is, is sure is sure to get noticed in a fun way. I love that because you can obviously be very expressive and open. Like you were talking about with your eyes and the rest of your body, just because your face might be covered up in a certain situation, um, doesn't mean that you can't express your attraction or interest in someone. So, okay. So we're going to play with that one and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to give ourselves permission to uh, explore that in a way that feels safe for us. Okay. Last thing. So you talked about this idea of the traditional date being oppositional because you're sitting across from someone. And I've always felt like at least in, even in my own relationship, if I can get my husband like walking and talking like side by side or stand sitting on the same side of the table, yeah. that there's more connections. So tell me about that, about, about how do we create a connection by the way we position ourselves? Yeah. So everything in nonverbal communication comes through years and years and years of evolution for, for human beings. And so when we talk about body orientation, we talk about proxemics, which is the distance between two bodies. And then we also talk about the orientation in general, in terms of the angling of one's hips and shoulders and, and feet also. Okay. If you are directly in front of someone face to face, it's adversarial. Interesting, which is crazy. That's how most dates take place. That's how most dates take place. That's how many business meetings take place. In a business meeting context, it makes a little maybe it makes a little more sense because you know there are two sides to that coin and there's negotiation and blah blah. blah. But you know, I would also say like, would, I mean, from a business perspective, don't you also want to 
be partners and collaborate and be on the same side. So that's a whole other issue. But in the dating world, definitely you want to get to know this person and you want to potentially partner with them and become intimate with them. And that whole conversation becomes a lot easier when you are, you know, shoulder to shoulder angled inwards, right? So what we avoid is that super intense charged face-to-face energy, right? Which especially when you're on a first date is I, in my opinion, too much. Um, it's something that more comfortable, like when a couple is more comfortable with one another, you know, you can handle it. It's a little bit easier, but, um, my husband and I, as a general rule, even if we like, we prefer to sit at the bar, if we do get sat, uh, at a table, we'll sit kind of, what's it called? Caddy corner. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Cause I, when we used to do those wing girl things, we would tell ladies, if you're at like a, um, a cafe like table that instead of being like right across, you kind of move like you're on a TV set. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. And you're like, you know, and you, and you orient your body like more. I wish, I wish y'all could see me like, you know, like (laughs) sideways, almost to the table, like crossing your legs. Maybe is that something that would help? Yeah. But the nice, the nice thing is that if the person say is on your right, you can, uh, you would angle towards them. Okay. You don't want to angle away from them. And if you feel like you do want to angle away from them, that's maybe not a great. (laughs) Then You should just Uh, say check, please. Yeah. So if you're angling towards them, right, then it, it shows that's a, that's a very clear, like full non, nonverbal cue to the person showing interest, right? And, and it is, it's a soft, non-intense, non-aggressive way of displaying that interest. Um, and, you know, you're also both looking kind of in the same direction, right? Like if you have someone who's facing you, it can also in some cases be like a defense tactic where like one person's eyes on the door and the other person's eyes on the window and you're like, you know, again, like we're just not, we're not in, in that state when we're dating. So, so why would you set yourself up like that if you can help it? Interesting. Okay. So I've heard too that, and it's like all the stuff I've picked up, that's probably half not true that when men are on a date, they, they unconsciously position themselves in a way to see the door because they're always looking like for the exit or this like protective thing. Is that true? I think that uh, by and large, if a man's, you know, trying to play the role of the gentleman, he'll try to give the lady the better view. So men, if any men are listening to this, give the woman a better view. Uh, Rachel, I could literally talk to you for 107 hours uh, (laughs) because I feel like we just scratched the surface of everything that you do. Uh, Ladies, there are links to Rachel's uh, website and her programs, and she has these really cool free communication power hour workshops. I, um, if you follow her on LinkedIn, she's always posting about them. They're really amazing and cool. And of course, she has an amazing book. Um, Rachel, I'd love to have you on the show again. This has been so helpful. If you were going to give one final piece of advice about how to show up authentically uh, with your nonverbal expression, what would it be? Well, I loved actually what you said, and I'm going to repurpose it here. When you said, you know, soften into yourself. So give your, I would add to that. I would say, give yourself a moment before the date and at times periodically throughout the date to just take a deep breath reconnect with yourself. Mm. And as you exhale, feel that soft expansion, right? Like just give yourself the, the freedom and the permission to like really ease into yourself. Ugh, I love that. I love it. You should listen to this episode every time before you go on a date. Really pretty much. That's it. I love it. Ladies. Remember no, no nonverbal leakage and whatever you do, Do it with some damn dignity. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for tuning into today's show. So if being in an intimate relationship in which you feel 100% seen, heard, and accepted by a high caliber man is a priority for you right now, and you're interested in seeing if you're a fit for working with me and my team at Dating with Dignity, here's what I want you to do. Just head over to DWDVIP.com. That's D as in dating, W, D as in dating, V-I-P dot com and book a call to speak with my team. We'll get on the phone with you for about 60 minutes and you'll get crystal clear on what's stopping you from finding true love right now. 
We'll also take a look at what you want to create, what you want your whole life to look like when you're able to finally be fully expressed as a woman in a healthy relationship with an incredible guy. And if we can help you get from where you are right now to where you want to be, we will show you the fastest path possible that makes sense for you to do that. We help smart, successful women all over the world solve this one missing piece in their life so they can finally have it all. So to see if we can help you do the same thing, head over to dwdvip.com. I'm Marnie Batista, and let's talk soon.